All righty, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Florida Nature Walk. My name is Margaret Davenport, and I am the Jill Abrahamson Memorial Environmental Education Intern here at Archbold. Today, we are joining Mr. Dustin as he explores the scrub and our education center. Please remember all participants are muted and your video cameras are off. You, uh, please use the chat button to communicate with either Mr. Dustin, myself, and other attendees. And please make sure you choose all panelists and attendees for everyone to see your comments. There's also a Q&A button at the bottom middle of your screen that you can use to ask questions for Mr. Dustin and our special guests to answer at the end of the field trip. All righty, that's all I have to say. Dustin, you around? Hey, Margaret. <laughs> Good morning, buenos dias, everyone. It's a beautiful day at Archbold here in the scrub. And uh, you might notice that things are a little bit different today because I'm actually not on the nature trail. I'm in front of our learning center right here. And the reason we're switching it up a little bit is because we have somebody else that's going to be out in the scrub today. Dr. Reed Bowman is our guest and he is going to look for some Florida scrub jays and maybe find a Florida scrub jay nest today, which would be pretty awesome. But I did wanna show you um, one of the plants out here that's blooming in front of the learning center. And then I'm actually gonna go in the learning center and show you some of the displays inside there that we have uh, on Florida scrub jays and maybe, you'll, maybe some other stuff too, we'll see. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it'll be a little bit different today. If you're tuning in for the first time, Archbold is located uh, kind of in the middle of Florida, south a little bit, uh, south of Orlando, and we're on this big sandy ridge. So I'm on about 120, 130 feet elevation right now on a whole bunch of sand. And because of that higher elevation, what that means is that this part of Florida has been high and dry for over a million years, maybe several million years. And that's different than the rest of Florida, which has been underwater during, during uh, times when the ocean's been higher. So that means this is a special habitat out here, an ancient habitat. Um, and it's a great place for a biological field station if you wanna study rare plants and that kind of thing. Well, one of the things that I always talk about out here is what is ecology? And I try to emphasize that it's not just studying a certain living organism, a certain creature, but it's about the connections between everything, between the different living things and the non-living things like, you know, the, the weather and um, soil and nutrients and that kind of thing. And this plant that's blooming today out here, I think is a really good example of how interconnected everything is. So let me just come down over here and show you what I'm talking about. And if you know what this plant is, feel free to put it in chat. But here we go. And I should say that this, this one is blooming, but it's a little early. I was just looking this up because it's like, this seems early to me. Generally, this is thought of as blooming in the summer, but here it is. And I think the insects are pretty happy because I just saw a bumblebee on here a couple minutes ago well, before we started. What could this be? Any ideas, this pretty yellow flower that you find out in the scrub. Sometimes it gets mistaken for the sensitive vine that we have where you can touch the sensitive vine and then the leaves close up. It looks a lot like that. This is a, uh, a Fabaceae, it's a legume. So when it gets its seeds on it, it looks like little pea pods. This is called a partridge pea. And it's called a partridge pea because birds like to eat those pea pods. Uh, in particular, uh, quail love it. So that's why, that's how it got its name, partridge pea. Now I, I told you that this had a, a really cool story of how it connects with other with other um, uh, animals out here and, and other things. So the first thing is, as I'm looking at it here, I'm seeing little ants. Well, not that little actually. I'm seeing ants crawling up and down this. And I think they move too fast for me to get my macro lens on them. 
Uh, I'm going to see little ants crawling up and down this, and I'm going to show you why. I'm going to put my macro lens on. We're going to look in. I want to show you the, the pretty flowers here. But I also want to show you something special about the leaves. So let's switch this around. And we'll take a close look here. Do you see what that ant is doing? Did you just see? I can't believe we just got that. It's going to do it again. Oh my gosh, he's doing it again. There's a little cup of nectar right at the base. All right, it's hard to, it's hard to tell where this is aiming. Oh my gosh. There he is up here too. Woo! Oh, I can't believe we got that. Okay, let me put this back on the little, the bases of these. If we can get it in focus. There, oh, oh. There we go. You see there's a little cup at the base of that leaf there. That little cup has sugar water in it. It has nectar. And that is what the ant is doing. It's going to that little cup and getting um, a sweet drink from it. And the ant then crawl all over these and protect this plant from um, any other insects that might wanna hurt it. So that is a pretty cool relationship right there. Okay, let's take a look inside here at this flower. These are so pretty. There we go. Now they have a really interesting way of being pollinated. There, let me get it in there. Because a regular um, a honeybee, the European honeybee, cannot pollinate these. What you need is uh, something like a bumblebee, because the bumblebees can buzz pollinate. They have to shake their bodies at a certain frequency to, to release, excuse me, to release the pollen on these, which is pretty amazing. And I did watch, uh, a bumblebee was just here you know, for a couple of minutes visiting the different flowers on here, going to each one, checking them out. Um, so we already see that this has an interesting relationship with ants. It also has an interesting way of being pollinated. The other part I can't show you is under the ground. Now the sand here, the sand here does not have a lot of nutrients in it. And this plant has a way of uh, not having to worry about it because it has a friend in its roots, a bacteria friend. <laughs> Just like we have bacteria in our guts that help us survive. This has bacteria, little bacteria balls in its roots and they're able to get extra nutrients out of the air that's trapped in the sand and take, um, take nitrogen from the air and feed it to the plant, which is pretty amazing. Okay, I just want to show you that because I thought I think those are really cool. So partridge peas. All right, we're going to pop up our. Um, we're going to pop up a video. You may remember AJ, the intern from last week. This weekend, I photographed her and interviewed her, and I made a little four and a half minute video. I just love listening to her, hearing her thoughts about how did she get into science and. Um, what does she want to do with her career, that kind of stuff. So check this out. Um, it was really funny. Uh, I was walking around my building. I was losing my mind because it was my beginning of my junior year and it had hit me. I didn't want to do what I thought I wanted to do my whole life. And it hit me that I was halfway through my college experience and I had to find something. So the building that I was in, I was walking around and I saw this poster and I was like, this woman is working with amphibians. This looks interesting. And I met her at a research conference at the school, like a little um, meet and greet type of thing. And then I emailed her and I was like, I kind of want to work with you. And then that's kind of how I got into research. And we did amphibian work, and a lot of that meant that we were out there at night in wetlands, kind of how it started. And then from there, I went to the lab right next door, <laughs> and I started working um, specifically in wetlands, looking at carbon dioxide and methane emissions or fluxes. So it was, it was kind of like um, a, since our labs were cool, I kind of got to cross over and I got to see both. But yeah, that was kind of how I got into this. I kind of just took a risk. I knew that. I wanted something different and I wanted to do something that I felt like it was important to me and I feel like wetlands was, was that for me and honestly research in general was that for me. 
I'm AJ. I am a research intern at Archbold and I'm going into my master's to work with wetlands. Yes, yeah, so I'm using the highest elevation in a rosemary ball to go to the end of a wetland and I'm going to look at that elevation gradient and see how does plant biomass in my nine specific species of plants change over that um, elevation change. So this is a Garmin. This is what we use to GPS our plants. So when we go out in the field, all of our plants are already GPS or we have a general coordinate where most of them are. And we use this to get to wherever we wanna be in the scrub or the forest, wherever we are. And this is a compass, very handy dandy. It helps with giving us direction. Let's say there's a flag and we have the coordinates, but we need to know in which direction the plant is, whether it's north, south, east or west, this is what gives us that direction be in school I want to get my PhD I mean I'm already like halfway there I'm going to get my master's but I would hope to be still doing something that I love hopefully working with wetlands I would also really enjoy um, having a lot of science communication opportunities to like share what I do with the public but also just like educating people on what's around them I think a lot of what science starts with is just community level like letting people in your community know what's there and why it's important for them to look around a little bit more and um, take in where they live because that is like directly affecting them all the time and they should take more pride and take more care of their areas mm -hmm. I think I always liked it. I just never was comfortable with liking it. So again, I had to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It was something different for me. Like I didn't know anybody who was like super into hiking. I had to get into hiking myself. I didn't know anybody who really was, you know, into environmental sciences. I kind of had to get into it myself. So if eight year old me saw me, she would be so confused. Like, how did you do this? How did you get here? And I could just tell her like, you just gotta go along for the ride. So I, it's actually like a, a huge privilege to, to be the person that I needed to see when I was younger. And I think it just kind of motivates me to keep going and like to get more people to see me. Cause I'm like, if you can see me and you can know that this is possible, then you can go out and do it. And then you can kind of make your own path on the way like I did. I think it's mostly the kids. Yeah, when I first told them I, was get, I got this job and I was telling them what I was gonna do, they were like, you can just do that? Like, you can just go somewhere and live and then you can go see them burn plants and you can go look at rare plants, Miss AJ? And I was like, yeah, you can. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, and then you can go look at birds all day and that can be your job. And then you can also go sample soil and that can be your job. Like, there's so many things that you can do in the science field. If you're interested in it, you can do it. It's just more about how hard, like how bad do you want it and what are you willing to do to like create that if it's not already there for you? And if it is, how are you gonna go about getting there? Fred, thank you, Margaret, for sharing us. I don't know about the program. We have 500 interns here, which is you know pretty amazing. That's kind of a part of what a field station is all about. It's not a regular nature center. It's a place not just for scientists, but for the next generation of scientists to train, uh, hone their skills and to see if it's what they want to do for their careers. And I saw in the, in the question, somebody saying, wait, where is this trail? Where are you guys? Um, if you missed the, we had a slide at the beginning that showed it. Uh, but I, luckily I have a map right next to me. So if you missed that part, follow me down here. Down at the bottom, we can see the outline of Florida. Here we go. Outline of Florida. And this little light spot right there is the Lake Wales Ridge. That's the sandy ridge that I was mentioning. And Archbold boop, is right on the bottom end of that right there. And if we look at the whole big map, we can see Orlando is right here. And then we've got Archbold way down at the bottom, a couple hours south of Orlando, drive south of Orlando. The reason I came in here though, was because I wanted to show you this. I wanted to show you our diorama. This is our scrub diorama. And it's a great way when I do start a tour here normally, when we're open to the public, we're still closed, um, but when I give a tour, I like to start here and give people an idea of what is this habitat like. 
Uh, but right now, what I want to show you is these birds that are in here. And these are, um, these are dead stuffed birds. They were real once upon a time. I'll switch my camera around so you can get a better look here of a Florida scrub jay. So there's a young Florida scrub jay there. And here's another scrub jay right there. And we've got uh, one more that's up. Up here, if I can get my camera there. There he is, or she. They both look the same to people, so. Um, and I'm gonna turn this back around again. Florida scrub jays are probably what Archbold is most well known for. Uh, I mean, we, we've been studying them for a long time and um, we've also been studying gopher tortoises for, for decades too. But these things are so cool. They live in family groups. They're uh, really fun to study. I don't wanna say too much because our guest is Dr. Reed Bowman, who's been studying Florida scrub jays here for decades. And uh, hopefully his internet connection will work out with the phone they've got out, on the, out uh, in the scrub. So let's see if they're there. Reed, if you're there, turn your camera on. You can turn your mic on. Yep. Hey, everybody. I hear you. In the scrub. Can you hear me, Dustin? I hear you. Okay, I'm going to turn my camera on stuff off and give you a, a few minutes, all right? Sure. Well, it's definitely scrub, spring in the scrub. I mean, when I come to work, I can smell orange blossom. And when I can smell orange blossom, that means one thing for me, that the Florida scrub jays are beginning to nest. And uh, so that's one of our biggest, most important jobs is to find all the nests of the Florida scrub jays. As Dustin said, Archibald has been studying these birds for 50 years. And we study all aspects of their life. They're nesting, how many young they produce, how long they survive, where they choose to live. This is all part of a big research project to understand what drives scrub jay populations up and down. So you can tell it's spring out here. Some of the folks are already popping out new leaves. Uh, so it's beautiful. I don't have to wear a heavy jacket. So we're just going to walk through the scrub a bit. One of our goals is to find the nest of the jay. Well, how do we know they're nesting? The jays give us all sorts of cues. Um, once the weather gets warm enough, the days are long enough, the jays know it's time to, to nest. And the first thing they start doing is what we call courtship feeding. The males will come in and give the females some food. It, it strengthens their bond, their relationship, because these birds care for life. And it also lets the female get a little bit of extra energy, which is good for producing eggs. Once that's done, then they actually start building the nest. And that is our big cue that they're nesting and how we find the nest. So the jays will go down into the scrub and they'll reach down and they'll pluck a little stick and they'll pull it up and the, and the male or the female will hold it in her bill like that. And they'll often sit up at the top of the scrub and look around. And when they see where they wanna go and they make sure there's no predators watching, they'll fly. And they fly to the nest and they weave that in. Now that's what we're looking for. We're looking for birds popping up with nest material in their bill. And we'll try and scan the horizon looking for birds with nest material as they fly and add it to the nest. Now, sometimes this year, the particularly early, they started really early. And it's possible that we could find a nest that already has eggs. And in that case, sometimes we use other cues that's doing that. So I've just seen a scrub jay on the horizon. I'm going to try and watch a little bit and see where it goes. So I can tell from the band, all the birds have color bands on their legs and we know each one individually by their unique band. 
I can tell from those bands that that's a male. Now he doesn't have any nest material in his bill, but he's certainly looking around like he's checking to see if the coast is clear. And there he goes, he's flying. And now he's landed again, and he's still sort of looking around. Again, probably because he's looking to see whether the coast is clear. Now, what's interesting is I don't see the female. Usually she's with them, helping to build the nest. If I don't see the female, it's possible that she's already sitting on the nest, incubating the egg. So, I'm gonna watch the male for just a bit. Oh, he's really, he's getting antsy, I can tell. Oh, and there he flies. And he goes down close to the ground. But, okay, I'll bet you that's where the nest is. He flew into a shrub rather than perched on top of the shrub. Usually when the birds land on the vegetation, they like to be aware of where predators are, so they land up on top. But if the male flies right into the shrub, that might be where their nest is. So we're gonna take a walk over there. We'll turn you back to Dustin and we'll see whether we actually find that nest. Oh, that was great. Oh, so cool, Reed, thank you. Uh, well, while they're walking over there and getting over to the, to the nest, I wanna show you, this is our scrub jay display right behind me here. So I'm gonna show you a couple of things. Um, also, I figured out I was having trouble earlier uh, with my camera getting on what I wanted to. Some reason my camera flipped, so everything is backwards on here from what I'm used to. <laughs> so that's why I couldn't I had such a hard time getting that flower in focus. So, um, so Reed mentioned bands on the birds, and you, and you mentioned you know trying to find a nest. So I'm going to show you. I've got some of that stuff right here that we can look at. So let's turn this around and here we go we have the our fake this is not a real egg here but there's a fake scrub jay egg this nest is a real nest it's an old scrub jay nest and they make a new nest every year so we didn't go and just take this from them um, they were done with this nest when one of our people collected it there we go another fake one check this out these are real ones. Not all eggs hatch. So if they don't hatch, then the researchers will collect them. Um, so those are real, real ones right there. Let's see what else we have here. We have acorns. The scrub jays like to eat grasshoppers and all kinds of things. But in the winter, when there's not as many insects around, they eat acorns. In the fall, they bury the acorns in the sand and then they dig them back up in the winter. To we also have some of these bands. You can see all of the different colors on here. And each bird will get uh, a few bands and that will be like giving it a name because they'll all have different combinations. And you can see I've got, a, here's a photo right here. Where you can see um, the, the, this has got orange and gray and silver. And this one here has, oh, I don't know what they call that, a light blue, maybe silver blue. So that is like giving them a name. They all, they all get their own bands. And here's a great picture of a Florida scrub jay. Reed probably took this photo, <laughs> would be my guess. All right, let's see if they are, uh, if they're, let me turn it back here. Let's check back in with them and see if they've gotten over there. All right, Reed, how's it going out there? Hey, we're back and I think we found a nest. We just saw a bird pop up from the scrub right in front of us. You can hear a calling. That's an alarm call, which they usually give when they're nervous about something near their nest. And that also is the female. That's the one we've been missing. So it's possible, oh, here comes the male in. He just said it now, they're, they're getting a little excited. We're staying back because I don't want to disturb them too much. But we have to go in close to the nest 
and check to see what's inside the nest, whether it's eggs or whether maybe they're still laying. Maybe there's only one or two eggs. So we're going to slowly approach the nest. But the goal is to look in quick, see what's there, and then back off. We don't want to disturb the birds any more than necessary. Here's the nest. Let me open it up a little bit. Come over here. You can get a great view of it. There are four eggs in the nest. And they're warm because the female has been sitting on those eggs and incubating them. Now that probably means that the clutch is complete. That's usually all the eggs that the bird will lay. I'm going to back off just a bit so we let that female get back on the nest. And we can we'll watch to see if she hops back on the nest. She's still sitting up above it. So we'll just back off a little bit more. And there she goes. She's going down to the nest and just inspecting it to make sure we didn't eat all the eggs. Normally, if some big animal comes to their nest, it's a predator that's going to eat the eggs, but we don't. And they actually get used to us coming. We don't come very frequently once we know how many eggs. So there were four eggs, and that's really typical. They usually lay three or four eggs. However, this is a really early nest. And in years when the birds begin to breed early, sometimes they lay five eggs. Really unusual, but like I said, much more common in an early season like this period. So we'll probably come back tomorrow just to see if a fifth egg was laid. So, and then now that we know how many eggs are in the nest, we will continue to come back until the eggs hatch and we'll count how many nestlings there are. And then we'll ban them when they're only 11 days old. And at 18 days of age, they fly out of the nest. So those eggs will get incubated for 18 days and in 18 more days, they'll be able to fly out of the nest, which is pretty amazing. 36 days to go from a just laid egg to a big bird that can be the nest and get around. And then they're banded, so we can add them right into our regular monitoring program and see how well they survive. Every month, we go out and find all those banded birds, so we'll know how long those babies live. Some of them might live to be 15 years old and become the most successful breeder ever at Arch Bowl. Who knows? So that's part of what we do every spring, and it's a great time to be out in the scrub. Thanks, Dustin. Awesome, Reed. Um, yeah, I'll just give you a couple minutes to, to get out of that area, and then we'll go to our question and answer section. And I'm seeing uh, questions coming in. So it looks like there's plenty of questions for you to answer. Uh, well, while he's walking off, just a couple of final things I can show you here. Um, I'm going to turn my camera around again so we can see this uh, display here. And I would like to mention too that this is actually an activity that's, that's on the Archbold website that's free for for you to download if you want to uh, try this out. The way this activity works is there's a scene in the scrub with numbers on it, and then you have to figure out what the story is. <laughs> so you end up getting all these little, uh, here's one that says, one young scrub jay is hunting for caterpillars in a small oak. So you, you have to figure out what's going on. And here we can see that would be number seven right there. Uh, I want to show you this part up here showing a scrub jay family because this is one of the things that makes them so interesting to study. They live 
uh, in family groups. Most birds don't do that. Once the birds are old enough, they'll, they'll move on. Uh, but for these, each family has a territory of something like 20, 25 acres. That's like the size of a big parking lot. And what we see here is that the older brothers and sisters actually stick around and help the babies. Here's a picture. You can see a little, little baby. There's a little baby face right there, a little nestling. Um, and they'll, they'll find food for the nestlings. And they all help to keep a lookout for danger and help protect, uh, protect the, their territory. Just pretty amazing. All right, let me switch back here. Now, the scrubges, the other thing, that, the other reason they're so important to study here uh, is that they are, um, they are a threatened species. So they have lost a lot of their habitat. Um, most of their habitat is gone now. So Archbold's one of those places that protects habitat for them and that studies them, learns how to manage the land for them. How do we make sure that if we do have a bunch of open space there that had scrub jays on it before, how can you restore that land so scrub jays can return, things like that. And I'll let Reed answer you know, all those types of questions. So let's bring Reed back on and see, um, find some answers to all these. I see all these questions popping up, it looks awesome. All right, Margaret, why don't you help us with some questions? Hi, yes, absolutely. We have so many questions and I will start with one, um, which we kind of saw the actual answer to, but asked when Dustin showed the fake eggs that we have in the education center, the question was, are the real ones that blue and do they lose their color over time? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, they are really that blue. They're, it's sort of a blue-green color, and then they have that brown speckling on them. They do fade just a little bit during incubation, but not too much. Um, so they, they still stay pretty vibrant. There is a lot of variation, not usually within a nest, but between nests. So one bird's egg might be quite different than another bird's egg. Um, and that's probably so that birds can recognize their own egg. Um, occasionally, it's not very common, but occasionally another female will dump, that's what we call it, dump her eggs in another female's nest. But if those eggs are very different than the female whose, whose nest it was, those eggs and toss them out. So there's, there's some value to having your egg look unique, different than other birds' eggs. And they, they definitely do recognize their own eggs. Before we go on to the next question, I just want to introduce our cameraman, who's one of our interns in the bird lab, James Longo. James, turn it around and say hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. And, and James is doing his independent project on bird vocalization. So if anybody has any questions about Jay Call for songs, they don't really have a song, but we do. Um, I'll let him answer those questions. Sweet, sounds good. Yeah, I'll turn it back around now. <laughs> All righty. Our next question is, um, do scrub jays usually nest in low limbs on a scrub or do they ever nest on the ground? Where is usually that position? That's another good question. Um, they never nest on the ground. But after that, it's a little bit variable. Most of the nests are head high or below in dense shrubs and oaks are really their preferred spot. But we found them high up in pine, high up in other trees. Um, jays never use the same nest twice. So every time a nest fails, they build another nest. And some jays tend to have preferences. So one jay might always like to build them low down close to the ground but not on the ground whereas another one may prefer to nest really high. We also know that they differ among sites so for many many years we studied jays in a subdivision a human subdivision where there were patches of stuff and those jays love to nest in orange trees right up near the tip top so maybe that was because a lot of the native vegetation wasn't there so they were trying to find something that was most like an oak, but not quite. 
And on the topic of nest, I'm seeing some questions about what the nests are made out of. And someone said they look like they're lined with pine needles. Yeah, another great question. So the nests sort of have two layers. There's the base, which is always stick, um, really sometimes pretty robust stick. And then they make what, they, what we call a nest cup, which is the lining. And it, may, it, it allows a nice soft bed for those eggs to sit in. Now the scrub jays, at least here at Archbold, almost always use the same thing. You know, there are two different kinds of palmettos in the scrub. There's saw palmetto and scrub palmetto. And one of the things that scrub palmetto produces are these little, little tiny fibers that peel off the individual prongs. And the jays will go down and pluck those fibers and they use those to line the nest. And what's really neat is when they first put that lining in, it's really rough. There's lots of little stray ends. And, and, but right before they lay their eggs, they do something we call tucking the nest. And they take all those loose ends and tuck them down. So we can actually tell when a bird is about to lay eggs because the bottom of that nest will be perfectly smooth, no loose ends. It's, it's an amazing task to build those nests. I, we tried one time just for a lab experiment to build our own jay nest. And they looked perfect until we picked them up. And as soon as we picked them up, they just fell apart. Whereas a jay nest, you can pick it up and toss it around and it won't fall apart for any of them. They're amazingly built. And how far apart are uh, nests? Hey, I, oh. oh, hold on, hold on a sec, Margaret. Just wanna show that I've got my camera here on that remember this is a real nest here so so what Reed is talking about here the sticks down here um, and this right here it, these are not pine needles these are little fibers that come off of the scrub palmetto and if you don't have scrub palmettos near you you might be familiar with the sable palms or cabbage palms um, those also have those same little strings that come off of them too okay so to answer the question on how close they are, jays have pretty big territory. So the average territory for a jay is about 25 acres. Now, sometimes two jay families will lay at the edge and their nest will be fairly close, but usually they're a couple hundred meters apart, a couple hundred yards, think of two football fields away from each other. So they're spread out pretty well. And another question is, what predators do scrub jays have? Well, it really depends on what they're preying on. If you're talking about nests, so eggs and baby birds, um, there are a few birds that would go after that, but mostly it's snakes. Snakes are the, a real big predator of, of jay nests. So they love to eat the eggs and they're happy to eat the nestlings. And, and sometimes they'll find a nest and they'll eat one nestling or, or two and then leave the rest. But now they know where it is. So if they're hungry the next day, they'll come back and get the rest. <laughs> Sometimes they do only take one or two. But, and then there's a few other mammals in the scrub that could take the nests. Um, gray foxes are common in the scrub. They climb trees. So we've seen gray foxes in, in trees eating the eggs or nestling. Another question that might be better for James to answer this, because he's a little bit more of a recent college graduate, but Jolene wants to know, what degree in college do you get to be able to research birds in the field? Oh, that's a great question for James. <laughs> well, my degree was in wildlife science. I went to the College of Environmental Science and Forestry, so they have a lot of really specific stuff like conservation biology and wildlife science. So any of those work. But even if you can only get a less specific degree, like something just general biology or anything like that, you're going to be pretty well prepared to get a job in the field. Most of the job postings just say biology or related field. So if you can get wildlife or biology in the name of your degree, you're fine. So that's my advice. Although I'm going to throw a little wrench in that answer um, because I've been doing this for 35, 40 years. But my bachelor's degree is in English literature. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I sort of changed my major after I graduated college, <laughs> but it worked. 
And I can speak to this. I'm an environmental biology and an English major. So um, you can do both and still end up somewhere in science, definitely as and well. It's actually a perfect combination because being a biologist often entails a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to more specific bird questions. With this population, is there an inbreeding challenge with such limited population size? Uh, that's a great question. So we actually have a fairly large population. I mean, if we include all of Archbold, we're about 120 families, which normally wouldn't have an inbreeding problem. However, over the years, we always get lots of immigrants and birds that come into the Archbold population from elsewhere. And over the years, as the populations around Archbold have declined, in some cases disappeared, we've noticed that the number of immigrants every year has gotten smaller and smaller. And those immigrants bring in new genes, new genetic material, and they're unrelated to the birds here. So as the number of immigrants has declined, the amount of inbreeding, even in our big population, has gone up. So it's not high enough to be a serious problem, but it could be if this population lasts another 200, 300, 500 years, which we hope it will. And then a uh, question that kind of touches on the Margo. same topic. Oh. oh. Hey, that's a good joke. I want to show, I've got a graph here that relates to a couple of things Reed was just talking about. He mentioned that there was, I'm turn this around, um, that there were scrub jays in the, in the uh, orange groves and that Archbold had been, I'll get this on there, had been researching jays in the suburbs near here. Um, and he was also just talking about how more recently there are less birds coming in from the suburbs around here and the other areas around here. And this gives you a good idea of why. So here's 1993 and there's 2001, 2011. The, the blue or purpley dots here, this is the population at Archbold that was part of the study. And you can see it goes up, goes down, goes up, but it's generally pretty even across here, pretty stable. Here is the population at that area near here the, uh, in the suburbs, started really high, really high, way more than Archbold. And we watched it over the year, well, it was before I got here, but Reed was part of this. Uh, watch those jays go down, 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 down. So even though they can utilize um, habitats that aren't perfect, they may not be able to last in high numbers there you know, indefinitely. You need that good scrub that's maintained with fire to, um, to really make sure your, your jays are in good shape. A question that we had a little bit similar to what we were already discussing is from Karen, and she wants to know if each family needs about 20 to 25 acres and they run out of acreage due to surrounding human development, what happens? And will new adults try to leave and find suitable habitat elsewhere? And is there any such habitat within access for the Archibald area? Yeah, so adult birds, when they form a territory, usually never leave it. They don't abandon it. Sometimes the territory shifts a little bit in space, but you know, they may move over a little bit, but they don't tend to abandon it. So if the habitat around it gets developed, the jays that are there, the, the breeding pair, will usually stay there until they, until they die. Um, it's their offspring that are more likely to leave it. So young always eventually have to leave their home territory and find a place of their own. And sometimes in jays, because these are cooperative breeders, the young might stay two or three years. In that kind of condition, like in the suburbs, the, the young usually left much earlier, usually within a year, and, and tried to find their own territories, often in another population. But as our populations, as our scrub patches become smaller and more isolated from each other, it becomes increasingly difficult for those birds to find a patch of scrub where they can settle. And that's part of the problem. We need to maintain connectivity among all these populations of jays scattered around the Lake Wales Ridge so they can move from one population to the next. That's really critical to scrub jays. 
Hey, Reed, one of our uh, attendees is somebody from Oscar Shear State Park, probably a, maybe a ranger from, from out there. Um, last time I was there a few years ago, they, there was at least one family of, of scrub jays out there. Um, if you can put in the chat, say, you know, are there still scrub jays out there? And Reed, have you ever done any work over there? I've never actually done any work there, but I'm very familiar with that population. So historically, it probably had quite a lot of birds and then they declined, but then they did a lot of restoration there. And at the time that they did that restoration, there were still scrub jays in the surrounding areas in the suburbs. So all those birds from the suburbs moved into Oscar Shear and the population became really large. But eventually all those jays in those surrounding areas disappeared and the population at Oscar Shear started to, to decline. And I, I think that there's still, I think there's more than one pair now there now. I'm not quite sure what the number is, but there's still a few. And as long as they can continue to manage that appropriately, they'll probably still have a few, but they might suffer some of the inbreeding problems of a small isolated population. Okay, the person just wrote in and said they have seven or eight families there currently. That's what I thought, and that's a good number. Great, another question about scrub jays, but pivoting a little bit, is what do they eat? Oh, scrub jays are true omnivores, meaning they pretty much eat anything. For the most part, they eat insects, mostly during the spring, summer, and to the early fall. And in the winter, they really depend on acorns. So acorns are produced in September, and each jay will find and bury up to six or 7,000 acorns, each one buried individually in the sand. And then throughout the winter, and that's when insect populations are lowest, they'll go find those acorns and eat them. But they also will eat small mammals, mice, they'll eat lizards. And I've often thought that if scrub jays were the size of crows, we might not want to study them. They'd be, they'd be pretty terrific predators. Alrighty, we'll take about one more question just because I've realized we've been talking for quite a while. Um, but the Riley family says they're from Virginia and they said once a titmouse tried to take a hair from someone they know to build a nest, and try to pluck it right off his head. Have you ever seen a scrub jay try to do that or a similar experience? Yes, absolutely. And I, I seem to have been a, a victim. I mean, used, I used to have really dark hair and they never did that. But when my hair got lighter, I won't say what color, um, suddenly they seem to think it's fibers all the time. So yes, they do that. Alrighty, I think that is all the questions we're going to answer for today. I will point out, as Karen put in the chat, that the winter 2020 issue of Audubon's magazine cover story is on the Florida Scrub Jay. Um, so definitely check that out if you have availability to. Dustin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, and that story is great. Photographed by Carlton Ward Jr., who has done a lot of work with, with Archbold, and he's a National Geographic person too. And it, it takes place here. <laughs> so it's a project about the research that um, Reed and other people here are doing. A lot of it's about uh, Sarah Fitzpatrick's work and, and John Fitzpatrick's work. So yeah, go check it out. Get yourself an Audubon subscription. Uh, I just want to end by saying thank you for James and Reed, you know, taking a morning away from field work to do some, some education and outreach. It's very much appreciated. Um, we'll be back again next Tuesday, but actually this Thursday, we're doing a, a special a field, virtual field trip. It's not Archbold that's hosting it. It's the um, Marine Resource Council on the East Coast. So we'll have another educator that'll be out over by Melbourne on some coast scrub. And then I'll be out here in the, at the Archbold scrub so we can compare the two of them. Uh, if you go on our Facebook page, the Archbold Facebook page, we're advertising it on there. And that should be pretty cool. And you may remember who that educator is in Melbourne because it's Megan Selva, who was the intern in the education department last year 
so it's really cool to see her out um, doing education on the coast now and to have a chance to do some collaboration. That's really fun. But that's it for me. Hasta pronto, amigos. I have a wonderful week, my science friends, and I'll see you later. Another huge thank you to Reed. Um, that is just such a cool thing that we got to see the nest and you answered all of the questions. If you had a question that we were unable to get to today, we will be sending an email as always afterwards, answering all of those questions. Um, that's all I have to say. So thank you all so, so much. And we will see you all next Thursday. I mean, sorry, this Thursday or next Tuesday. Have a good day.